took almost a decade, but Elon Musk's Neuralink have finally begun implanting their brain-computer interfaces into human subjects. So it seems like a good time to talk about the looming existential risk posed by such devices. The entire future of human life hangs on a five-word hypothesis authored by this man in 2018. If he's right, then Neuralink and other brain-computer interfaces have the potential to obliterate human consciousness as we know it. Five words. Consciousness does not multiply, it expands. Back in 2018, Neuralink was still very new and very theoretical. Today, we are right at the cusp of the transhumanist age. We are right at the point where brain and machine begin to merge. And if he is right, then things are about to get very weird. This man is Peter Watts, a zoology PhD turned hard science fiction writer whose 2006 book Blindsight won him a cult following among neuroscientists. The reason? Blindsight explored the idea that consciousness is a parasite contributing nothing to its host. Apparently, this idea resonated with neuroscientists puzzled by consciousness. As we'll see, it's helpful to have neuroscientist friends when trying to figure out the impact of novel technologies on the mind. In his talk titled Conscious Ants and Human Hives, Watts argues that if these brain-computer interfaces work exactly as they're meant to, then each of our individual consciousness will dissolve into a single giant super-consciousness. Note that this isn't if they go wrong, but if they work exactly as they're supposed to. This whole story hinges on a small nugget of flesh in your brain. This nugget is called the corpus callosum, and it is the bridge connecting the two hemispheres of the brain. It's a congested road between two metropolises. And as it turns out, you can live without it. But if you're a regular viewer of The Living Philosophy, then there's one thing you certainly can't live without, and that is learning. I'm always looking for new ways to learn more and today's sponsor, Imprint, is a whole new tool in that arsenal. Imprint is all about helping you learn quickly, conveniently and what I love most of all, visually. They have these great courses on things like finding joy and meaning and the one I've been digging down on called Essential Philosophy Theories and Thinkers, which I'd highly recommend for anyone trying to get a good grasp on the giant millennia long history of philosophy. And what's great is that it fits in easily with my day-to-day life. The lessons take two minutes to complete, which is perfect for me while I'm brushing my teeth, waiting for the kettle to boil, or while I'm in a long queue in the supermarket, and it beats the hell out of checking my email or news feeds. And it's not just courses, they've got these daily reads, and while I was researching this video, there was even one on brain-computer interfaces. And they've got a library of visual summaries of books, which I'm finding to be a great way of figuring out which books I want to read fully. Imprint was named Google's app of the year and they have over 30,000 five-star reviews on the App Store and Google Play. To try everything Imprint has to offer for free for a full seven days, scan my QR code on screen or click the link in the description or the pinned comment. As fans of The Living Philosophy, you'll get 20% off Imprint's annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Imprint for sponsoring this video. And now, let's talk about why you can't live without the corpus callosum. Way back in 1939, when things were beginning to get real nasty in Europe, William Van Wagenen experimented with a radical new treatment for severe epilepsy in upstate New York. Van Wagenen got the idea from observations of epileptics who developed cancer in their corpus callosum. In the early stages, their seizures continued as normal. But once the tumour got bigger, the seizures stopped. And not only that, but there didn't seem to be an impact on their consciousness either. In his 1940 paper, Van Wagenen noted that consciousness wasn't lost in these subjects when the seizure was limited to one hemisphere. As the corpus callosum was destroyed, generalised convulsive seizures became less frequent. As a rule, consciousness is not lost when the spread of the epileptic wave is not great, or when it is limited to one cerebral cortex. And so, at the University of Rochester, Von Wagenen undertook a novel procedure on 10 patients between the ages of 10 and 43. He cut open their skulls and burned their corpus callosums into oblivion, thus severing their two hemispheres from each other. 
In total, there were 26 patients, and they went on to become one of the most legendary cohorts in the history of science, the split-brain subjects. Of the original 10, 7 experienced less frequent or less severe seizures. University of Rochester psychiatrist A.J. Akalatis studied the patients, testing IQ and examining behaviour, and found that they had the same level of cognitive ability and showed no behavioural or personality changes. Roger Sperry thought otherwise. Sperry pioneered the field of split-brain research, and a couple of decades later he won the Nobel Prize for this work in 1981. He suspected that Achilletus had tested only one hemisphere, which is why he hadn't noticed anything amiss. But Sperry's studies of split-brain cats and monkeys told him that the two hemispheres operated independently. The Rochester patients were referred to Sperry, and so began the golden age of split-brain studies. The decades of research that ensued have radically altered our understanding of what we are, and of consciousness itself, and give us some of the most bizarre stories in the history of science. In contrast to what the University of Rochester psychiatrists observed, the lives of split-brain patients in the months after surgery are more like fight club than full health. Images of conflict between the left and right hands were common. I knew what I wanted to wear, and I would open up my closet, get ready to take it out. My other hand would like to take control. They would reach in and get something that I wouldn't want at all. You know, and then I get, I don't know, frustrated and I throw the one on the bed that I don't want. Instead, of, a lot of times I can't even hang back up. This physical struggle was emblematic of a deeper divide. In splitting the hemispheres, it wasn't just the body that was divided, but consciousness itself. Where once there was one, now there were two. Legendary neuroscientist V. S. Ramachandran talks about a split brain case in which the hemispheres diverged enough that one side was an avowed atheist and the other a devout Christian. In the absence of the corpus callosum, the mind decohered into minds. Instead of a single self, we are left with selves, each with their own sets of skills, that are often in competition with each other. Neuralink works in the exact opposite direction. There are a million different threads to follow in this research, each one unraveling everything we know about the mind. Split brain research has changed the way philosophers and scientists think about consciousness, the nature of the self, and free will. The thread Peter Watts follows is the corpus callosum, and the argument he makes is, as we've noted, Consciousness does not multiply, it expands. And following up the corpus callosum thread, Watts contacted one of his new neuroscience friends to try and figure out the speed of communication between the hemispheres through the corpus callosum. After some back-of-the-envelope calculations, the neuroscientists determined that the speed, or in silicon terms, bandwidth, wasn't much different to a smartphone in 2018. The corpus callosum connection between the two hemispheres, then, is high speed and low latency, like terabit broadband. It enables near instantaneous communication between the hemispheres. When this is severed, it's not like there's no connection between the hemispheres, after all, they're still connected at the brainstem. But where the corpus callosum was a super fast broadband connection, the lower brain connection is more like dial up internet. And this is where we reach the crux of Watts's caution with Neuralink. Somewhere between this dial up speed of the brainstem and the broadband speed of the corpus callosum, we hit what is called a critical point. A critical point is a term from the physical sciences for the point at which a system undergoes a sudden qualitative change in its properties or behavior. There is no qualitative difference between water at 5 degrees Celsius, water at 98 degrees Celsius, and water at 99 degrees Celsius. But when it crosses the threshold between 99 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius, it transforms. A mere 1 degree Celsius change makes 101 degree Celsius water a different animal. It crosses a threshold, hits a critical point, and undergoes a qualitative transformation. The same goes for water at 0 degrees Celsius when it becomes ice. In the belly of the sun, something more extreme happens. The ordinarily repulsive forces of atoms are overcome. The heat and pressure of the solar belly crosses the critical point and the repulsive forces of atoms are broken through, leading to a massive explosive release of energy 
which has given life to everything on our planet. Watts' argument is that consciousness, like these other natural phenomena, has a critical point. In the case of consciousness, that critical point isn't to do with temperature or pressure, but speed and bandwidth. And so, somewhere between the bandwidth of the lower brain's dial-up connection and the corpus callosum's broadband connection, there is a critical point. At that critical point, the individual consciousness of the hemispheres crosses the threshold and like atoms in the furnace of the sun's core, they merge and something new is formed. In the sun, two hydrogens become one helium. In the brain, two eyes become one greater eye. No left hemisphere atheist and right hemisphere Christian, just a slightly larger consciousness going about its daily business, doom scrolling and businessing. In other words, consciousness doesn't multiply, it expands. And that brings us to the present moment and scenes like these. This is Neuralink's first human test subject, Nolan Arba, playing chess with his mind. Things didn't go smoothly with this first operation with only 15% of the electrodes in his brain staying in place. But it's enough to be life-changing for the quadriplegic, who describes it as being like using the force. The second operation with the test subject Alex seems to be going better with much better function. He's playing Counter-Strike now without any joysticks or buttons, just all using his mind. In the next few years, these human trials are going to gain momentum and this technology is going to mature. While it's still a long way to go from motor control like these first subjects to the telepathy that Musk spoke about on Joe Rogan. You wouldn't need to talk. <laughs> the future is coming. And as we approach that day, Watts' prediction is going to be put to the test. If we can get to the point where communication is so quick that you wouldn't need to talk, will we even have multiple individual consciousnesses to speak to? When the bandwidth connecting me to you increases in speed from the slowness of thinking, then speaking or texting or however we communicate, when we cut out the middleman of language, might we not then expect the boundaries between us to dissolve? Will we not become like those two conscious hemispheres pooled together into one thanks to the bandwidth of the corpus callosum? If consciousness does have a critical point, then when is Neuralink going to take us past it? I'm trying to imagine what this super consciousness would look like. Would it be hell or would it be amazing? What follows are my musings, but I'm sure many of you will notice elements that I'm missing and I'd love to hear them. I'm also curious about how many people find this possible future appealing. Who would love to be part of a collective versus being an isolated consciousness? The thing is, it's a hard concept to wrap your mind around. It's absurd to think of a consciousness having multiple bodies. How can you be conscious and have a billion bodies? But then again, I'm conscious and I have trillions of cells. I don't worry about the day-to-day -day management of protein synthesis. I don't worry about regulating my heartbeat or the CO2 in my blood. I don't spend long hours in creative work coming up with my dreams or the characters in them. So much of the organism that I am operates without any conscious oversight. My ability to control these cells and systems from a top-down command center is, for the most part, illusory. I can control my breathing, I can go to the gym and the sauna, I can hold my breath, I can eat a more nutritious diet, I can spend a few months at Everest Base Camp. All of these things I can do and influence the workings of these systems, but it's less like willful control and more like systematic puppeteering. I'm tilting the floor of my organism. If I'm not careful, then I'll be too hungry and I'll fail in the diet, or I'll avoid the gym or the sauna, or get lost in my thoughts and lose focus on the breath. There's a delicate balance as a conscious agent of two hemispheres and 36 trillion cells. So is it really such a big deal to speak of a consciousness operating at the level of a billion humans? Is this not just the next organic evolution in consciousness? A consciousness which can draw on not just two hemispheres, but billions? How would that look at the level of a transhumanist superconsciousness? Will my consciousness, my sense of interiority, really disappear and be dissolved in the infinitely bigger superconsciousness? Then what would my life look like day to day? Would there be no interiority? Obviously, this shouldn't sound strange to me, since I'm not surprised to think that my individual hemispheres don't have consciousness while I'm online. So why does it seem weird to imagine myself as just a cell in a transhuman body? My mind immediately goes to sci-fi and I think about a war between those who join the superconsciousness and those who don't. Would taking down a single body in the superconsciousness be easy 
or no? I guess I'm thinking about the Will Smith movie adaptation of Isaac Asimov's iRobot, when the AI Vicky takes control of all the robots and humans end up fighting the red-chested robots as individual consciousnesses. Who really knows though? This is what the technological singularity is. It's the point at which technology advances so far that you can't predict what will happen. If you'd only ever seen water, there's no way you could predict steam or ice. It would blow your mind. Maybe it's futile to imagine what a super consciousness would be like. One thing is for sure, we should pay some heed to Watts' prediction on the small off chance that he's right. Since neither of us are neuroscientists and we don't even know when or if Neuralink or any other BCI will reach the level of telepathy, then maybe this is more of an interesting apocalyptic premise to play around with. Whatever happens though, we're in for a wild few years ahead. That's everything for this episode of The Living Philosophy. I'd like to thank David Pilibosian, Sasha Canton and all the other patrons for their support of the channel. If you'd like to get access to bonus content like book clubs, long form interviews with creators and experts, monthly Q&As, or if you just want to support the channel and get your name in the credits like these fine people, then you can head over to Patreon. As ever, if you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments, otherwise I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.